you know, I, I have a, a soft spot for both the neighborhood and for the Tenement Museum, which is such an institute, has become such an institution in the neighborhood. Um, uh, I want to just say a little bit about uh, how I came to write the book and, uh, and maybe read uh, small bits of it before uh, Adam comes up and we have a conversation. Um, the uh, uh, writing a memoir uh, was something that I had tried out a couple of times in very short pieces and it was because I found that when I was writing literary criticism or cultural history, personal things came up and I found that when I used uh, some personal element to illuminate a, a subject that was outside of my experience, that either the prose came alive or I came alive. It was uh, it, it, it somehow, to use a cliche, empowering, and uh, and it seemed to uh, to reach uh, into a different part of my brain. And uh, when you get to a certain age and you you then the vehicle has put on a fair amount of mileage, I found that uh, uh, I thought it would be a good thing to sort of get this down and and. Uh, sort of deal with it. Uh, and I thought it would be mainly a family memoir because I came from a very, on my mother's side especially, I came from a, uh, a large, very raucous, boisterous family. My mother uh, was initially, originally one of eight children. Uh, eight, uh, six of them came to America, survived into adulthood and came to America. Three, three boys and three girls. And, uh, and the I mean, you could write a thousand-page novel about the tensions and the battles and the, the love-hate relationship uh, among these siblings and how it was eventually passed down to the next and, the, and then to the next generation. This, of course, creates a problem. Uh, uh, you, you know, you, you want to talk about that world as you saw it. On the other hand, uh, Though the my parents' generation is not around anymore, their children and grandchildren aren't around, and you can't censor it. You have to exercise a certain amount of discretion. Uh, my wife said, "Oh, they'll never read it." I said, <laughs> "I said people will always find a way to get to something where they're in, you know." And so, but what happened as I was writing it was that I found that a lot of the family stuff got into one long chapter, and came up very little later in the book. I mean, it, it, it sort of, it turned from a family memoir into something different. Uh, probably, when I mean, I didn't really understand it until uh, I finished writing it, and I found that it was about going from a fairly parochial world, both the Lower East Side and uh, Orthodox Judaism and yeshiva education, to, um, to a kind of wider world that may or may not have been better, but it was very exciting to me. And so I had ended up writing something of a kind of coming of age story uh, that had a little bit of cultural history because I wanted to show how the times had influenced me. Uh, I, it, it has a little bit of a kind of intellectual autobiography since I became something of a scholar and a critic and a, and a, and a university professor. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, it became a love story because my, uh, the woman that I met who became my wife and we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary in January was a very important part of the story. Uh, people have asked her, how do you feel about being in the book? Or they've asked me, why did you put her in under an initial L when everybody knows who it is? <laughs> I said, because I couldn't write it using her name. Uh, I mean, I, I, I could only write it... Uh, giving her a kind of shadow, slightly shadowy presence in the book. Because if she was fully there as a character, you can't really write about someone that you're living with and hope to go on living with them. <laughs> uh, so uh, it worked. Uh, and, and so what I did throughout the book was I used different kinds of citations. She was an initial. My college friends, I used just their first name, though some of them are quite recognizable. Uh, other people that I knew later who are best, best known as scholars, I use their full names because that, that's important. Uh, 
uh, that my, my teachers uh, were quite distinguished figures, some of them, uh, and I use their names because they, they had a tremendous impact on me. On the other hand, uh, there were neighbors on Henry Street where we lived who kind of adopted my sister and me. And I had written about them in an article, a little memoir in the 1990s, and I had changed their names even though neither of them were alive. And uh, for some reason, their names were Murray and Rose, and for some reason I was able to write about them by calling them Esther and Jack. <laughs> Why that was, I don't know, but it, I needed, I didn't fictionalize it. Everything that I said I hope was true. I checked things out as, as much as I could, but uh, they had become characters for me under the names of Esther and Jack, and so when I wrote this book, my, my sister just asked me the other day, why did you change the names of the neighbor? Why did you change their names? And I said, because they had become those, those people to me. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if that's going to happen to the, the book as a whole. Now, I mean, it's notorious that when you write about something, um, what you then remember is not what happened, but what you wrote about it. And, uh, you know, to a degree, I'm sure it will unburden me of some of these memories. But on the other hand, it will probably become a kind of snapshot that will fix them in the way that I wrote about them. Uh, the, uh, I'm, just the other day, I was reading a wonderful memoir by, uh, that really is a family memoir, by a writer named Alexander Stiller. And, one of, and since his parents were no longer alive, uh, one of his main sources was uh, his father, sister, and aunt. Uh, and at the end of the book, the book really ends, and then there's a coda of about five pages. And he talks about giving the manuscript to his aunt to look at. And she hates every word of it. She disagrees with everything that he said. And, uh, and he finally realizes that, you know, this is how people are likely to hate being characters in somebody else's story. That it fixes them in a way from a point of view that is not the way they are likely to see it. And to a degree, this is what, you know, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop in terms of people from the next and the next generation and my family. Uh, so far, friends who are in the book uh, are, are, as far as they've told me, pleased by how they, they're portrayed. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, the discontent will well up from other quarters. Anyway, I, uh, I thought I would read just a little bit from, from the L Lower East Side portion of the book. Uh, and what happened is that, well, the, the entire family lived on the lower, various parts of the Lower East Side. And I'll, I'll give you a, just an image of the family, if I can. This is the Reitman family, my mother's family. Uh, you'll note the gentleman in, in hats along the back row. Uh, my uncle, my father, another uncle, and then two little twerps also in hats, me and a cousin of mine, and then uh, yet, an, yet another brother. Uh, in the next row, uh, you'll see figures that figure quite a bit in the book, which is the three sisters. My much older Aunt Lily, the gray-haired woman. The youngest sister, Fanny, or Faye, or Fradl, as they called her in Yiddish. And then my mother and my sister in front of her. And then a few other members of the family. Uh, the, uh, one of the interesting things that was challenging about it is that I, I wanted to find out exactly how and when they got here. And I, a lot of the Ellis Island uh, 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 Information is online now, and I looked, I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I found absolutely zero under the name Reitman, R-E-I-T-M-A-N. And then I remembered that very distantly, someone in the family had said, you know, I don't think that was really their name when they came through. That was not their name in Russia. Their name was something like Chaitman. <laughs> 
but they couldn't get it down at Ellis Island, and so they became Reitman. And so I put in Chaitman, and I used the Russian spelling, C-H-A-J-T-M-A-N, and suddenly the entire story was there. And the date, the ship, the place that they came from, the Russian names and the Yiddish names and the English names that they were given, and so I, and I, and, and you know, and so on. And I had all this information, and it was worth about half a sentence in the book. After all, what was I going to do with it? I wasn't there. Uh, my mother uh, often said to me when she, in her old age, she would say, oh, I had such an interesting life, you have to write my story. <laughs> and I said, I can't write my story. It's your story. I can't write your story. She said, I'll tell you what to say. <laughs> the problem with her telling me what to say was the fact that she came here at the age of nine or ten, and her memories were really very, very thin. She had five or six key memories that she repeated endlessly, and the rest of it was a child's eye view of the world. She told me that when they arrived in the port, and, and in, in the case of both my mother and my father, uh, their father had come before the war in 1913 with the plan to raise enough money to bring the family over. And World War I intervened, and they were stranded. And so the family did not come over, in my father and mother's case, in 21, 22. Luckily, just before immigration, it was essentially closed off. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, f uh, essentially, this was, the, I mean, this was the story. And, uh, and uh, uh, it, I couldn't really use it very much because I didn't really have my mother's, I didn't really have much about my mother's life to, to go on. And I think this is why, in a way, the family portion of the book uh, became shorter and other parts of the book that I remembered in more detail became longer. Uh, the, uh, the thing about the Lower East Side, of course, uh, my friend Marshall Berman, who was into the book, uh, uh, he used to say about these neighborhoods that immigrants grew up in, particularly the Lower East Side, uh, he said the main thing that people wanted to do about the Lower East Side was to get the hell out of it. <laughs> and all of those uh, 1960s ideas about the culture of poverty were very relevant to these immigrant neighborhoods, which were after essentially neighborhoods of transition. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were the parts of the new world in which the first, to some extent, the second generation of immigrants had been able to construct a kind of simulacrum of the old world. All the synagogues, I mean, I mentioned that on Henry Street, there were these shtibelach, they were these little synagogues, each of which was associated with a particular town in the old world. And when the next generation lost interest in their sources in those towns, there was nothing else for them to be there. I mean, I was shocked when I went back to Henry Street in February to see that one of them actually was still there as a kind of benevolent association, okay? Well, I was at 130, 133, yeah, between Rutgers and Pike, and this was just a just a uh, one or two down from from our building. Uh, anyway, this is just to introduce this section. Um, what happened was that my parents left for Queens in 1949, and but I was going to a yeshiva a block away, also on Henry Street, around 165 Henry Street. And after much discussion, I was in the fifth grade. After much discussion. Uh, they or I decided to stay in the school, even though I was now living like an hour and a half away in furthest Queens. So I went in the fifth grade from walking one block to school to taking three a bus and three subway trains to get to school. Now the school day was long. It was nine in the morning to six in the afternoon. 
And if you added on at least an hour and a quarter of travel time, it meant a 12 hour day and at least to some extent a somewhat impoverished childhood, which I've nevertheless thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, so uh, my history on the Lower East Side actually continued even after I moved to Queens at the age of nine. Uh, and I brought this up in, in 1987, Descent Magazine uh, had a reprise of a famous issue on New York that they'd published around 1961. They had a new version of it. And they asked me to do something for it. And so I wrote a little piece that really was a kind of rehearsal for this memoir called Three Neighborhoods. And one of them was about the Lower East Side. And, and that part of it got picked up by the historian, uh, his Hasya Diner, in her wonderful book called Lower East Side Memories. And then the second part was about Flushing, where I spent my teen years and where my parents continue to live. And then the third part was about the Upper West Side, where I've lived for a long time. So uh, anyway, this couple of pages that I'll read, I think I'll read a, about the, uh, the period when we had already moved to Queens, but I was still coming back to the Lower East Side. And I'll see if I can find that. No, my sister, who was four and a half years younger, uh, always went to school in Queens because she hadn't started school yet when we moved. Now, the uh, the uh, I mentioned these characters, Esther and Jack. Uh, Esther and Jack were a childless couple who moved in right next door to us on Henry Street on the day that I had what is called my pigeon haben, the, the 30 days after I was born when my father was able to purchase me back from the local Kohen. And uh, because Esther and Jack did not have any children, they kind of adopted my sister and me. And when I wrote an article about this in the 90s, Someone said to me, I can't believe it, you not only had a classic Jewish mother, you had two classic Jewish mothers. Uh, and one of the things that happened was when we moved to Queens, that Esther and Jack suggested that I continue to come to their house, come by for lunch in the midday, stay over if it was snowing and so on. So I still had a second home really on the Lower East Side. And I say here, one benefit of having such surrogate parents as my mother and father uh, saw it was that I could continue at school on the Lower East Side. To them, this was the only authentic Jewish neighborhood in America. I had to carry on there from keep, to keep them from going astray, but also to make up for their own departure, however arduous my daily trek might be. Though our corner of Flushing had a small conservative synagogue. To them, the area was a goyish wasteland, not really a place to raise Jewish children. It was an Irish and Italian working class neighborhood. They'd first heard about it from one of their Italian neighbors on Long Island. But so it had, this had to be, this was my parents' trade, their parnassa, their livelihood. But placing their son and heir in a local public school would have been a step too far. I had to be that much more Jewish to make up for their transgressions, which were built into living there. My parents, my father had opened the dry goods store and in the, and the first few weeks he tried actually to keep the store closed on the Sabbath. After a few weeks trial, they found it impossible to keep the store shut on the Sabbath. They had tried and I can imagine how much anguish discussion went into this big step. Otherwise, they felt they couldn't survive. My duty was to carry on the Jewish life that they had so compromised and to carry it into the next generation. 
the Lower East Side, the yeshiva, were links to their youth, ways of keeping faith with their Eastern European roots. On Sundays, when the, door was clo- when the store was closed, they traveled back to the old neighborhood with its kosher delicatessen, delicatessens and dairy restaurants to buy real pickles at Gus, genuine rye bread and marble chiffon cake at Gertel's, and ready-to-wear items at cost right here on Orchard Street, uh, both for themselves and for their customers. This was where much of their family still lived. Though many immigrant Jews and their prospering children had fled, the ghetto meant poverty to them, poverty in old world ways. For my parents, the neighborhood where they had been raised could never really be replaced. And one of the recent reviews of the book said quite accurately that my parents romanticized the neighborhood from the, exactly the moment that they left it, uh, which is quite true. How much, where am I on time? Okay, I think, I think uh, we can get into the conversational part of this, but let me run through just a few pictures from the book and uh, uh, about, so you'll see pictures of my parents, uh, my, myself and my sister as children, and a few from uh, later life. My mom and dad in Central Park, which was their main uh, recreational area, Myself, my father, and my sister. The baby picture. Uh, you can see from my curly hair when my parents hesitated to give me a haircut until I was really rather advanced in age. And here are those ringlets, uh, a rather pudgy kid. Uh, years later, I found, when they first did give me a haircut, I found a lock of my hair in a drawer of their dresser. They, there's a story in the book connected to this sailor suit that I wore when I was two. Uh, my grandmother was on her deathbed. And this is, my wife can't believe that I really remember this, but it's actually my first memory. Standing at the foot of the bed and, sa- and saying to her, please, Baba, don't die. Look, I'm wearing my new sailor suit. And she died the next morning. Uh, my wife thinks that uh, this is the source of my feeling that I had superhuman powers. <laughs> Much later, uh, uh, myself and the woman who is called Elle in the book is on a ferry when, when I was a graduate student at Yale and this was a ferry that took us from Bridgeport to Long Island when my parents had a place. This was uh, around the same time, a year that I spent in Cambridge, England, uh, where the what, the great sport on the river, the Cam River, is called punting, and you stand up in this squarish boat, and you use this pole to thrust you forward on this uh, rather shallow river. As a graduate student trying to get away from working on my thesis, finally my uh, getting my PhD at Yale, my one-year-old son and my mother, two children by 1970. They didn't really love each other exactly. (laughs) This was so false, you wouldn't believe it. And finally, 1972, my own little nuclear family. Uh, Anyway, uh, why don't we get on to the Serious part of the evening, Adam Kirsch. I'm so delighted that he can come. Not too serious, I hope. Um, should I grab this? Yeah, why don't you take it? Is this, uh, we might have each other's. Maybe we should. Okay. Yes. Do you want to exchange microphones? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight to talk with Mars 16 about his book, um, which we've heard a little bit about already about the Lower East Side and childhood, but really the book goes on until you uh, begin teaching at Queens College. So it covers your education, youth, young adulthood, um, marriage, uh, first children. So there's a lot, a lot in the book. And hopefully we can talk about some of those things. But just to 
talk a little bit about the area that we're in, the neighborhood that you grew up in. You, did you have a sense growing up in the 1940s, which was really sort of the end of the Jewish immigrant Lower East Side, that it was the end? That I had no idea. I, in fact, uh, later when I read novels that were set 50 years earlier, like Call It Sleep or Jews Without Money, I mean, I felt a real continuity. Gradually, I realized that that p part of the neighborhood had kind of thinned out. Uh, but so much of what we associate with a neighborhood like the, I just came down Second Avenue and the Jewish theater was very, still very vibrant in the 40s. So this is a period that would have started really in the 1880s. And, and so mm. you're saying that even in the, in the 1940s, that culture was still sort of going strong. Well, probably someone who knew it earlier would have, would have thought that it was not what it was, but to me as a child, it certainly seemed very vibrant. Mm. What, was it, what was life like on the street? Was it push carts? Was, it, uh, was, was that still? No, there were no push carts. Uh, but, what did I drop? Oh, Just it's okay, sure. Uh, was it people speaking Yiddish mainly on the street or at home? No, I mean, I, I guess it was to that degree Americanized in the sense that, um, you know, I, my parents were relatively young. Uh, their, the people who lived in the building, the people in the neighborhood were all relatively young. Uh, some of them had been born in Europe, some of them had been born here. It was really more an Americanized generation. My mother had gone to school, high school here. Uh, the thing, of course, is that my parents spoke Yiddish when they didn't want the children to understand. So the children, of course, learned Yiddish extremely well, which was very helpful when I went to the yeshiva, which was an old-style Talmudical academy, where, which was conducted largely in Yiddish. Do you still speak Yiddish? I haven't spoken Yiddish in 50 years, but I probably could. <laughs> Um, one of the sort of themes of the book, the subtitle is a sentimental education, and it's an education in a lot of things, but uh, mainly in English literature. Out as a child, you were learning Talmud, right? You were learning uh, classic Jewish texts. What was that kind of education like? Well, we didn't start Talmud, uh, and the problem that I found was that once we started Talmud, uh, everything else was excluded. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew part of the curriculum, the Jewish part of the curriculum, was each day from 9 to 1, six days a week, including Friday. And everything else except Talmud was left for about an hour and a half on Friday. Hmm. Bible, history, you know, well, you know, everything. And, you know, initially Talmud was a challenge, even though as I say in the book, you start with the laws of tort, you know, a knock an ox, scores a neighbor's cow, and so on. It was kind of, kind of logical challenge. Uh, eventually, we got into areas that I thought were very peculiar to be teaching to 9, 10, 11-year-olds. Uh, the tractate on divorce, the tractate on, on, on marriage, uh, full of all sorts of sexual details that most of us had no idea. I mean, we just took it abstractly as an abstract problem. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the book I mentioned, I, one story about how in what, studying one of these tractates, we were studying all the laws having to do with what in Aramaic is called bia shaloka darka, unnatural intercourse. And the kid raises his hand and says, Rebbe, Vos is bia shaleka daka. What is, what is unnatural intercourse? And the rabbi says, you tell me what natural intercourse is and I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> so were you learning secular subjects in the same school? Yeah, and, and, the same, and from one to two to four in the afternoon were the secular subjects. And there, I think it was a pretty rigorous education. Uh, some of the best teachers taught in the school, regular school system including the principal of the English department, you know, taught in the school system, the principal taught at Stuy t math at Stuyvesant and arrived three o'clock in the afternoon, he arrived to be the principal of the English division of RJJ. So, uh, I mean, some of them were kind of odd misfits, but a lot of them, I mean, I was very, very fortunate in high school to have at least two superb English teachers and one really excellent history teacher. Uh, 
and a pretty good math teacher as well. Uh, so I got a, a decent education there, even though I was decathecting very strongly from the Talmudical side of the curriculum. And you mentioned in the book that at a certain point you sort of went on strike and said that you, wouldn't, you would refuse to study this anymore. It had stopped speaking to you completely. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was very odd. It, it may have been puberty-related, age-related. It may have been related to the fact that uh, just before this, I'd gone off uh, to, uh, to work in a hotel in the Catskills where I experienced the great freedom that I hadn't had under my parents' uh, uh, benign thumb. Uh, and, and then I came back, and I had been doing very well in Tom, but in fact, I had been skipped a couple of times so that I was really in a very advanced grade. And from the beginning of that year, I just refused to learn a single additional page. And there were no exams. Uh, the principal would come around a couple of times a year, and he would do a kind of oral interchange with each student individually. And how I ever got through those, I don't know, because they kept passing me on from grade to grade. Uh, but it had, it had, it's odd because Adam is studying Talmud right now, and I think you probably didn't study it as a child. No. And he's come to it as an adult. I had it as a child, and it's the one part of my early life. Uh, I mean, the, the, I mentioned a piece that I'd written in the 90s about an autobiographical piece, and it was called The Law of Return. It was about the fact that after my father died in 1992, I went back to synagogue to say Kaddish, and I got very involved in all the stuff that I'd left behind 30 years earlier. And, uh, and so my editor was very set on uh, calling this book, too, The Law of Return. I said, it's not appropriate. This is not what this book is about. This book is about getting away and not about returning. And uh, anyway, uh, I think that that may have triggered the rebellion, the fact that I had really gotten away that previous summer, and I was determined to stay away. It really is the book. A lot of the book is about getting away, getting away from home, getting away from uh, one of the sort of themes of the book is dietary restrictions and how you continue to keep kosher for a long time, living in lots of places mm -hmm. until finally one, one day in Paris, right? You decided you were going to try, try something different. At the age of 29. I mean, I really, really hung on to keeping kosher quite a long time, five years after my wife had already given it up. Uh, but she kept kosher. The host house was kosher for, you know, and so on. Uh, but, and she had given it up at exactly the same place in Paris five years earlier. Uh, so don't send your kids to Paris. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I still, there's still certain things that I will, I will not eat pork or bacon or uh, ham or something like that. I mean, it's just too ingrained. Uh, but, uh, and friends of, of mine think I'm very inconsistent, you know, that I will eat some things and I will not eat other things and so on. But, you know, I have to, I've learned to live with my inconsistencies. So you, you went from a very Jewish uh, religious education to Columbia University. And you say in the book that for, for a short couple of days you thought about maybe going to Yeshiva University instead. Well, in my senior year of high school, despite all of this alienation, out of something, I don't know what, I suddenly felt that I was on the wrong path and that I shouldn't go to Columbia. I knew nothing about Columbia, except that it was supposed to be the best university in the city. And a couple of people the previous year, who graduated the previous year, had gone to Columbia. And in fact, the principal, whom I mentioned before, had gone to Columbia, class of like 1925. And, uh, and but somehow I thought, you know, this was the wrong path. I should go to Yeshiva University which I hadn't even applied to, and that would be continuing the direction in which I had been going in most of my life. So I put in a late application, and I had a kind of fervent teenage religious revival. Uh, and after about three weeks, it dissipated, and, uh, and I went to Columbia. And Columbia became a big part of your story in the book because you, end, you left for graduate school at Yale and then came back to Columbia to mm -hmm. teach. Um, what was it like going there as an undergraduate for the first time? This would have been in the late 1950s. Uh, 
Well, the Columbia had and still has a wonderful undergraduate curriculum. It's part of a large Ivy League university, but at the time, and perhaps still now, it was the smallest undergraduate college in the Ivy League. And one of the benefits of its size was the fact that whereas many universities have their introductory classes in large lecture courses, Columbia had and has a core curriculum which meets in small sections, 90 sections, you know. And this is a kind of introduction to the Western tradition. Nowadays, that's considered too narrow, but, in those, but for me, or for most, most of my, uh, people I knew then, being introduced to the whole larger Western tradition in a kind of total immersion was a tremendous opening. And, uh, and I think that that became the beginning of the story of moving on and opening up. And, uh, and I think it, it, as I say in the book, it encouraged you to become, eventually, if you found your professional niche, it encouraged you to be a generalist more than a specialist, and it encouraged you to be more of an intellectual than a scholar. Uh, or if you went to become a real estate mogul, it, you still had that as the other part of your life. And, and so it was a very important part of my education. When you got there, did you already know that you wanted to study English literature? What kinds of things had you been reading as a teenager? Well, I think as a sophomore in high school, I had discovered certain serious novels. Uh, in the book, I mentioned The Scarlet Letter and The Tale of Two Cities. And I was tremendously excited, not only by what they was about, which they're both historical novels in a way, but I found myself tremendously excited about how they were written and how they were put together, almost like the carpentry of these books. And, uh, and I thought, and it fascinated me that, I mean, when I read The Tale of Two Cities, and I've not reread it since, but I remember my feeling at the time that there were all of these multiple threads of plot and theme and had Dickens had turned around and tied them together so beautifully at the end that I wanted to reread the book. I don't remember, I think I did reread some of it after I finished it. And I've only had that experience once later in life when I read a novel by Thomas Pynchon called V, which is also extremely intricate, and I, there I did reread it from the moment that I stopped reading it. But I, without thinking that I wanted to become a critic or a teacher, uh, I could see that both literature and ways of talking about literature were already fascinating me. And, uh, and so, you know, I was on a path. I think that, uh, as I recollect it, the turning point came at the end of my sophomore year when I read a, a, a book by Jacques Barzin called Teacher in America. I mean, I should have realized that there were university professors in America because I had them as my teachers, but I didn't think of it as a career path. And that made me think that it was a possible career path. And along with that, I read a book of essays by his close friend, Lionel Trilling, called The Liberal Imagination. And that was the most beautiful collection of critical essays I had ever read. I'd never read a collection of critical essays, probably. And I thought, well, that, that would be a challenge to do something like that, that relates, that's not only about literature, but relates it to a wider world and uh, has written not technically, but in a kind of conversational voice. And I think at some level that became a model for me. And one of the things that you capture so well in the book is the, the feeling of cultural ferment and, and things changing in the late 50s going into the early 60s. We sort of tend to think of the 50s as a period of calm and, and repression. But in fact, you talk about how it was very exciting to be in New York at that time. There was a lot in terms of uh, literature and theater and film that sort of opened up your, your intellectual world? Well, I happened to be opening up at a time that American culture was sort of opening up. I mean, some people might have thought, did think that that opening was lamentable and was leading towards anarchy and chaos and moral and a kind of a moral abyss. But uh, I think that I was very primed to receive it because I had a very tight, close-knit, Jewish moral education within a fairly intimate family and uh, breaking out was important to me and it was weird that the whole culture was going through a kind of coming of age or at least an opening up in much the same way I was in my personal life. And so, I mean, I never became a hippie or uh, moved off 
to a commune or something like that. But to a degree, uh, I became fascinated with both the changing mores of the times and also uh, with the, the, the culture that it produced, like P writers like Pynchon, Allen Ginsberg, Kurt Vonnegut, you know, the later Robert Lowell. Uh, uh, a lot of that involved a similar kind of opening up from tight-knit verse or well-knit novels to a much more picaresque kind of fiction and a much more surreal kind of poetry. And, and that spoke to me. And later, when I came to write about the period, I found that I could combine my personal recollections with a literary discussion, and they seemed to mesh together. And you were also listening, as the, as the sort of 60s developed, you are listening to rock and roll, and you write about that in the book as well, listening to the Beatles and Dylan and as the Rolling Stones, as these things were, were first coming out. Well, I, as, as a kid in the mid-50s, I had discovered WQXR. And I remember sitting in the back of my father's dry goods store, no customers, and I, didn't have, I, was, I was watching the store. My father probably went up to stairs to have dinner or something like that. And there was a radio in the back. And I turned on the radio and... There was a program, I think it was called Symphony Hall, from 8.05 to 9 o'clock. And I listened to two pieces of classical music, and I was absolutely enthralled by it. And uh, I had very similar literary experiences where discovering traditional culture, not hip culture, but traditional culture, was the opening, was the excitement. Uh, now, at some point in the 60s, I found that some of that very culture that I had discovered and that had so excited me, I didn't have access to it. Suddenly, for a few years, I couldn't read a novel by Henry James, whom I had loved a few years earlier. And I couldn't listen to classical music because rock had put me and us onto a different beat, a different rhythm. Uh, and that passed. But, you know, I found that they were not as contradictory as they were, as I thought they were. But yeah, I mean, rock music was was very important to us. It, it, you brought up Henry James, and I, one thing I wanted to ask you is, there's a famous um, passage in James's autobiography, uh, The American Scene, or, which is a record of his trip to America in 1904, 1905, in which he goes to the Lower East Side, and he complains about hearing Yiddish spoken. And he talks about how Yiddish is going to be, or Yiddish speaking people are going to be the, the destruction of the American language. Yeah. And then so many of them went on to become the great scholars and caretakers of English literature. So I wonder, did you ever feel, uh, and you write about, about this in the book, um, that there was any barrier between you as someone coming from the Jewish tradition into English literature, that you were being kept out either institutionally or psychologically in any way? Well, let's say that, uh, um, let's discuss literature in general, that certain things were more, um, were, were felt more comfortable to me. I mean, Henry James, to me, I mean, I can understand, you know, Henry James was shown around the Lower East Side, and he heard all this Yiddish, and he called it the torture rooms of the living idiom, he thought. <laughs> and what, what he really felt was that, something that's very easy to feel, which is that he had been displaced. That his place, his New York, had been taken away from him. Uh, and I, I, I find that completely understandable. Now, to me, Henry James, because he's so introspective and so analytical, uh, the, mo you know, the most psychological, the most intellectual of novelists, to me, Henry James is very Jewish. Uh, uh, so I didn't. I, I don't think I. When I first read James, I don't have. I didn't have trouble reconciling James to uh, the tradition that I had come from. Uh, but obviously, certain writers like Kafka and Dostoevsky, uh, uh, because of their themes, uh, were more amenable to me. Even an anti-Semite like Celine, the French writer, uh, because his he his. B best novels are written at a pitch of hysteria familiar to me from my own family, <laughs> I could appreciate uh, these novels by the worst anti-Semite in 20th century literature, but there we are. And what about when you were studying English at Columbia and then at Yale, 
this was in the early 1960s. In, in an earlier generation, one generation earlier, you would have had people actively steering you away, right, from studying English literature, saying that it was a profession that was not really open to Jews. By the time you were doing it, did you, was there still any of that sense, or had that disappeared? The, I think, you know, it, it wasn't there at Columbia, but I think that by the time, when I got to Yale as a graduate student, there was probably still some residue. It was a much more waspy environment. And it was not only a much more waspy environment, it was a much more male environment, so that I would say that the women there probably felt a lot less comfortable than the Jews. Uh, it was only recently, I, as I mentioned in the book, it was only recently when I came that women had been admitted to the graduate program. And ironically, the, the, you know, they, 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 the deal that they made with the faculty in the English department was that if they agreed to admitting women, they still had the right to exclude women from their own classes. Mm. And one of, the, one of the diehard professors who did that was the world's leading authority on George Eliot, the leading woman novelist of the 19th century, you know. So talk about strange days, you know. And you mentioned that you, you lived in a rooming house with some other Jewish students where you could keep kosher together and, and you made contacts in the New Haven Jewish community, which is where your wife grew up as well, but you didn't she meet did. her at that no. time. No, we had crossed paths at Columbia because she was at Barnard and then we met uh, a year after we both graduated at a boat ride sponsored by a Zionist socialist organization called Mizrahi Hatzair. And uh, neither of us was a member of that organization, but we had friends who had been and who sort of had dragged us along. And so we were somehow, it, in a way, it's our background that fated us to meet. And this And this, this story of your courtship and the love story is another one of the main stories in the book. Um, you talk about how it was a struggle against your families to spend time together. You had to sort of sneak, sneak in your time together and then go back home at night to keep up the proprieties. Well, when I would come home at 4 a.m., my mother would say, what are you doing all night? And I thought we were talking. She said, how can you talk so much? She'd say. And, of course, she was someone who could talk 24 hours a day. <laughs> I guess you didn't see me that way, but uh, no, it was uh, it was you know the the freer morals of the, that came in in the later sixties were not yet in place, and it was complicated. I mean, uh, when she graduated from Barnard in nineteen sixty one, I think half of her class got married right then and there, right out of college, because uh, that was the only way that young people could be together. Uh, when we moved when I, uh, to New Haven, before we, six months before we were married, we spent the days together, but she went home to her parents' uh, home to sleep because otherwise our lives would have been untenable. And there's a very funny story about a bikini. Do you want to tell that story? It's a, about what happened in the summer on Long Island. Well, this is where the morals of the 60s began to kick in. Uh, we had been traveling around Europe, and we, uh, she discovered these very, very brief bathing suits that were not yet in fashion or not yet even known here. And she bought one or two and uh, wore them on the beach of a very lower middle class, very conservative town on Long Island when my parents had a bungalow. And all of my, mo my mother's brothers and sisters had houses there, as I describe in the book. And they were just shocked to their boots by this bathing suit. And my wonderful Aunt Lily, Tante Lily, who was the family spokesman, though my mother had probably put her up to it, said to my wife, she said, it's pastness, she said, it's not right for a professor's wife to go around on the beach, knock it. <laughs> and my wife said, He's only a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> well, one day we came back crossing the ferry and the bathing suit that had been draped over the bathtub in the bathroom, half of it 
the bottom half was gone. <laughs> and she looked and she couldn't remember where she had left it and she looked and looked and looked and looked. And uh, she went next door to my Aunt Lily to ask her if she had any idea what might have happened to part of her bathing suit. Well, you could have lit a can. I mean, she went up in smoke. Oh my God, oh, you're accusing me of something. Oh, oh. Well, 20 years later, after her funeral, her son-in-law, who adored my wife, said, you know, you know what happened to the bathing suit? <laughs> Lily took it and she threw it down the outhouse. <laughs> anyway, there's a picture of her in the bikini in the book. It's, it's one of the, I mean, it's a great story and it's also one of the sort of representative stories of the book because it is about that clash, that clash that we've been talking about in so many different ways. Another clash or, or sort of two worlds that you inhabited were the journalistic critical world and the scholarly world. Um, how did you first come into contact with Partisan Review and with the, the sort of New York intellectual scene when you were in college? Well, a lot of the New York intellectuals who wrote for magazines like Commentary and Partisan Review there were several of them, like Trilling, who were on the faculty and who were, had been teachers of mine. And I recall it was around the middle of my college years that I suddenly find my, found myself buying the latest quarterly issue of Partisan Review and maybe Dissent Magazine and taking out a student subscription to Commentary Magazine. And... Uh, but these were all the grown-ups who were writing it. I didn't think of myself as being a candidate for it. But I kept in touch with my teachers after I graduated. And one of the people that I kept in touch with was a professor named Stephen Marcus, and who was, had recently become an assistant editor of Partisan Review. And about halfway through my first year of graduate school, he wrote and asked if I'd like to do a review for the magazine. And, uh, I thought, wow, you know. And uh, so I started writing for Partisan Review at the age of 22 and continued to do so for the next 41 years uh, until it folded in 2003. So uh, anyway, and then wrote for Commentary and New Republic later in the decade. And uh, it, it just, just, just happened. And I think, I, you know, I've often said that had I ended up at, a, at, instead of Columbia, had I ended up at the University of Wisconsin or the University of Michigan or, or in a college campus somewhere, probably my peer group, the audience to which I wrote, would have probably been professional peers in whatever field like romantic poetry I was in. But because I was in New York, what interested me more were the people that I was seeing every day, which was, you kind of say, the metropolitan audience. So the key to New York intellectual life was simply New York. Uh, you know, it's the people that you see and the people that you become your friends whom you'd like to, to write to and to have them read your stuff. And so this became the path that I didn't really choose but somehow was chosen for me. And at the same time, you were doing scholarly work on Keats. Keats was the right. subject of your dissertation. But I, th I hoped, when I, I, I think because I'd already started doing journalism, I'd hoped that to be able to write a critical book on Keats that would still be in a language as accessible as a book review for Partisan Review, which is not totally accessible because it's not a, you know, fairly intellectual, but nevertheless clear, free of jargon and so on. And so I didn't really discriminate between scholarly work and journalistic work. In the same way that later when I was teaching at Queens uh, and also at the Graduate Center and on some semesters I was doing simultaneously a graduate course, a senior seminar and a freshman course. And someone said to me, do you have trouble adjusting from one level to the other? And I said, no. You say what you think, you make sure that everyone gets it, you don't assume any range of reference, you explain what you're talking about. I didn't feel that I taught any differently at the PhD level as I did at the freshman level. Uh, and I felt the same way about, about critical writing. Well, one, one sort of question that 
leads into a minefield is, does that still exist? I mean, is it still possible to write about literature for a general audience? One of the complaints that you hear a lot about the way that English studies have evolved over the last 30 or 40 years is that there's been a loss of that interest in talking to a general audience. It's much more hermetic, much more theory driven. Have you found that? Well, this is what happened in the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, partly the influence of French theory, partly just, partly the job market uh, heightened the sheer prof professionalization of literary studies. Uh, I mean, it had certainly been professional before, but um, I think much more accessibly so. And I think that that theory, you know, uh, people talk about the neglect of the humanities and the lack of, people don't value the humanities as much. But the humanities, to carve out a niche for itself and a language for itself, is partly responsible for the, uh, the, the, the neglect of the odor into which it came. And uh, so, you know, uh, I went from being in, you know, a young Turk, you know, you know, very much in tune with the new culture of the 60s to being a bit of a, uh, of a traditionalist, really hawking back to an older style of literary discourse. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I was never in much sympathy for, with the turn towards theory or jargon or this high degree of professionalization. What are some other things that have changed in the profession over the years that you've been in it? Um, you hear about the humanities in crisis basically all the time now and fewer majors and fewer resources. Um, but what are, what are sort of the, the strengths of the profession as you see it? Um, well, the funny thing is that uh, the older professional literary culture was very traditional in the sense that they were field 17th, 18th century, you know, romantic poetry, Victorian fiction, and so on. Uh, and in that uh, spectrum, I felt very much that things should be opening, opened out and that a much wider literary study should have a much wider range of reference to philosophy, to psychoanalysis, to sociology, to cultural history, and so on. The moral is, watch out what you wish for. Because part of this theoretical turn was, in, in an English department today, you haven't the slightest idea of what the specialties of people will be. And often, very little of it has anything to do with literature. That, that kind of wide open terrain that I, uh, that I was very much in favor of at the time has, to me, become a kind of anarchic, you know, I'm interested in everything and qualified on nothing, you know. And so, you know, in a way, this, what could have been a positive turn in literary studies, and occasionally still is a positive turn, also became one of the great negatives where, you know, you have people writing historical criticism, and historians try to read it and they can't make any sense of it. Uh, you have sociological criticism done by people in English departments or anthropological criticism done by people in English departments where they're borrowing from a field that they don't fully understand. And I remember a sociologist like Daniel Bell, who was a very wide-ranging man of letters, I would have lunch with him. He had been a teacher of mine. He would say, I haven't the slightest idea what these people are talking about. Tell me what they're talking about. So uh, I think that to some extent, scholars, professors cordoned themselves off, made themselves inaccessible to even the most intelligent people in other fields, and uh, you, might, you might say ghettoized themselves. Um, one of the sort of turning points maybe in the modern university was the 1968 and the sort of occupation and strike at Columbia, which you write about in the book. Could you tell us a little bit about what, what it was like at Columbia in 68? What happened was that Columbia was swept up in the, in the conflicts of the larger culture. There were two issues that came up. One had to do with race in Harlem and the building of a park on, a gym on uh, park land, which would have one entrance for people from Harlem and another entrance for Columbia people, a really segregated gym. Um, 
the other was an institute for defense study that Columbia was a part of. There'd never been any controversy about it. But because of the uh, Vietnam War, things like that became very controversial. And uh, uh, the radicalism of students uh, uh, took, out an appropriate, took on an appropriate local dimension and the campus blew up uh, and uh, five buildings were occupied on the Columbia campus and eventually after a week the, uh, the police were unfortunately brought in and many people were injured including some faculty. Uh, and it became something that, that led to copycat demonstrations in hundreds of universities over the next year or two. Uh, the uh, students and to some extent the faculty felt that they had to sort of bear witness to the agony that they were going through, that the United States was going through in Vietnam especially. Uh, and other people felt that the university had gone and fallen into a kind of anarchy. And a lot of those latter were you know, alumni who had stopped giving money to the university. So it went through a very lean period throughout the 1970s. Uh, and eventually I could see how it damaged the university, but it also uh, allowed the university to testify to an, um, on an important social issue. And you write fairly on the whole sympathetically about, about the protesters and what their concerns were and how they affected the university. It was, there's another line of sort of, that goes from those events to neoconservatism, which is, and, which is the not the path that you took. You have remained on the left. Well, yes, I, people I knew very well were so turned off by what happened there and a few other conflicts of the late 1960s that they turned toward a neoconservatism that was not really unprecedented for them because people like Irving Kristol had been relatively conservative liberals in the early 1950s, very anti-communist. So it was, for some New York intellectuals, it was a resurgence to their uh, early Cold War attitudes, and for others it was a resurgence to their old radicalism of the 1930s. So that was the split. Both of them were kindled by it and moved back, but to different phases of their lives. And your own work, has you've written about the 60s and the 30s um, in different books, or what's the... How would you compare the two periods? I mean, one that you lived through and one that you didn't. Well, initially I hesitated to take on a project on the 30s, first of all, because I hadn't lived through it. And that personal dimension, as I said at the beginning, was important to me. But also because I felt they're too similar. In other words, these were things, what, moments when of conflict, when culture and politics, everything became highly politicized. How could I, I would be just writing about the 60s all over again? When I got into the 30s more, I discovered that it was really very, very different in many ways. And, uh, and uh, uh, I won't go into the differences now, but the Depression made all the difference. Uh, one was the product of, of post-war prosperity, uh, and the, the radicals were the children of plenty, really. And the other was the product of pre-war poverty, uh, and uh, by largely the, by the children of immigrants. And so the two, working on the two subjects really led me in quite different paths. Do we want to have time for questions? Is that? This is, this is too serious a question for what you're... Um, I looked at the... There's an essay of Lionel Trilling's on the teaching of modern literature, which, although I haven't read your book, it seems to be important for you in that, from what I underst understood, you took it very personally since you were, the, you were the fall guy for part of what he was saying. But... I read, it, I read it the other day, looked at it again the other day, and it seemed, the essay seems to raise a number of questions that are never resolved. And one of them, just one of them, seems to be the, the, the whole value of trying to bring literature into a classroom setting. Now, maybe Trilling eventually says, but, you know, it's worth it 
if we can have a conversation about it. But I mean, do you, do you feel the essay was well successful, or as, as I said, unresolved, or are you you keep coming back to it and find again the questions that it raises are still troubling? Well, in terms of its impact, the essay has proved to be one of the enduring statements about modernism and modern literature. My problem was that when he that he built it around this course he had been teaching on modern writers. Excuse me, and um, and he, and I had taken the course six about six months earlier. Now it's possible that he had written it a year earlier and given it his lectures elsewhere, and it hadn't wasn't about our group. But we felt that Trilling had a peculiarly dialectical way of thinking. Uh, he thought about things by associating around them, but becoming discontented with them. And here he used his discontent with his students' response to modern literature, uh, which he considered a very uh, kind of apocalyptic and very demanding, very challenging literature as it is. Uh, and implicitly, I felt that he was saying, oh, we took it all in stride, but his generation, who had been young our age in the 20s and 30s when all this came out, had really bowled them over, that it they had really taken it very seriously. And I felt it was inappropriate to use your students that way, in addition to the fact that I felt it was untrue to what had actually happened in the class. First of all, we had taken it as seriously as his generation. I, when my friends and I read these really revolutionary writers like Kafka, Joyce, Beckett, uh, Proust, Thomas Mann, Yeats, Eliot, and we had come from high schools where they were still reading Hiawatha. Uh, I mean, it really blew us away in probably much the same way that it had done for his generation, that that new literature of the 20s had had that degree of staying power that 40 years later, it was still rather shocking and quite demanding. And so in that respect, we felt that he had traduced us that it was wrong. The other thing was, that his discontent was already so well established that he said, oh, I don't want you to write papers for this class. I'm sick of reading undergraduate essays. He said, I I'm, I'm think maybe I'll just ask you to write a three or four page biographical summary of the writer's life, about which none of us could have been less interested. And of course, he didn't do that. But, you know, uh, anyway, uh, I was unhappy at the time. Uh, but, uh, I could see that it was a strategy for highlighting uh, what he what he deeply felt about modern literature, and we forgave. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, much earlier in your talk, you mentioned moving to Queens from the Lower East Side. Where in Queens did you move to? And what did that mean to you as a, as a kid at that time? Well, we moved to Flushing, uh, not the Main Street area, which in the past 20, 30 years has become very uh, completely Asian neighborhood, but a little further out, about a mile or two further out, which is why I needed a bus in addition to the three subway lines to get to, uh, there and back. Uh, and uh, we moved to uh, a lower middle class or working class Italian and Irish neighborhood where there were relatively few Jews. And this was, I think, the main change in addition to the fact that I had so much traveling to do. Uh, the fact that I was now living in, I'd moved from a very Jewish neighborhood to one that was not the least bit Jewish uh, meant that a different set of antennae went up and, you know, uh, just a different experience. And uh, uh, I think it was more like America than living on the Lower East Side had been. And I had, had we moved out of New York, that would have been even more like America. So there's a lot of memoir literature about the Lower East Side from the turn of the century, or people's experiences at the turn of the century, and came out later, Morris Raphael Cohen to do a Morris, A Dreamer's Journey, 
um, rose cones out of the shadow, um, so male and female. But one of the things, and even in the more the fiction that's more autobiogra autobiographical, there seems to be more of a distance um, from religion, that that's a really important turning point in people's lives or their development, is to kind of really a sharp movement away from religion. And in your memoir, it's much more part of you for a long time. It's something you think about, but it's not, it, you didn't seem to feel the need to have this sharp disjuncture. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is, do you think that might be because of moving to Flushing and having a different experience there as when you were young or? Well, I, I just had a different background from most of the New York intellectuals whom I admired. They came from almost entirely from non-observant homes at an earlier period. And as I say in the book, their religion was working class socialism, most cases like Alfred Kaysen and so on. Uh, I, my background was really much more like the younger Jewish writers and especially the novelists today many of whom come from an observant background. In other words, the, 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 the level of Jewish literacy or Jewish cultural literacy that the young writers have today is very similar to what I had at the time, though their formation's a little different. And whereas people that I know, I, I mentioned in the book how a young colleague of mine, Herb Leibowitz, uh, who's a wonderful critic, a poetry critic and so on, uh, how uh, he and I used to regale the other assistant professors at Columbia with stories out of the Talmud. Uh, I discovered that even though I've never gone back to the Talmud, uh, my own feelings about my orthodox background really are very well summarized by that phrase, the law of return. In other words, I got a relatively benign Non I wouldn't say non-coercive, but somewhat non-coercive version of it. My wife, who grew up in a German Jewish family, which was very German, but Orthodox, got an extremely strict regimen that she turned against very totally because she had had such a, uh, uh, had been imposed upon her so rigidly. Uh, so for me, it was more of a gradual transition with a kind of nostalgia and return at the end so that to this day, a part of me feels that at least the modern version, you know, not the extreme version, but the modern version of Orthodox Judaism is the only really authentic Judaism. I mean, people say about Israel, where you know, there's very little of the conservative or reform movement, that Israelis want the synagogues that they do not go to to be Orthodox. You know, and I feel the same way. Uh, you became professor, uh, educator, scholar, and your wife came from Barnard, so she's <laughs> well educated and stuff. So, uh, did she stay home, take your kids, and then go back to a career or what? I'm sorry, Can I say that again. Um, did like did your wife stay home, take care of the kids, or the, uh, later on went to a, got a career? Um, she uh, she's had several careers. Uh, but I think mainly she stayed, I mean, she started out as a pre-med and a scientist. When we met, she was working in a, in a lab. Uh, then she became a science writer for an encyclopedia. Uh, she transitioned from that to be a book reviewer, mostly writing mostly about literature, especially feminist issues and women's writing. But uh, after a certain, when, after our kids were born, she uh, essentially was a freelance writer who could stay home and, and take care of the kids. So uh, in that sense, we had a relatively traditional marriage, though she was always doing something professional along with it. Thank you very much for a wonderful um, conversation. And um, thank all of you. Um, the book is for sale here at the museum. And if you buy it tonight, you get 15% off. Also, if you would like to go to Russ and Daughters Cafe, you can take the receipt. <laughs> and you're able to get, I think, 10% off a, a meal there, the new restaurant that's across the street. Um, but please uh, join me in thanking uh, Morris and Adam for this wonderful conversation. Thank you.